All right, good morning, friends. It's um, Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday. I had my me early, I was having an early morning meeting with some friends in England strategizing about uh, business. Uh, so did that this morning early because it's like, you know, 11 after in the uh, morning over there and it's, you know, five here. So I uh, was busy doing that, uh, praying for all my friends on the coast. Uh, we have family down there and then we have a lot of friends that live down there in the the coastline of the panhandle of Florida. It's getting hammered right now, a lot of, a lot of flooding. Um, so we've been uh, just praying about that and uh, we'll feel the effects of that, I think, this afternoon, a lot of the, the rain and wind and, and whatever. So I know depending on where you are, I know I got people listening all around the world, uh, but hope things are well in your world. Hope you're staying safe. Uh, hope uh, things are really, really good for you. Hope you're staying COVID free. Uh, I've got a pastor friend of mine that's uh, on a ventilator and uh, just kind of, uh, we've been praying for him as well. And um, so uh, life's, life can come at us, can it? Uh, so, hey, we're uh, right now though, we're in the book of James and we're in chapter four. And I, I just, the more I saturate myself with, with James and, and revisit him, uh, I so appreciate the the passion. You you can see his emotion as he writes. You can you can see him get excited, and then you can see him uh, you know kind of go on a serious deal. Then you can see him begin to plead with us, uh, and then you can see a little bit of anger, uh, which is what we're going to see today. That kind of wells up within him, and, um, and and I love that about about James. There's a when you see someone passionate like that, uh, it means they care. And, and so it's just it's valuable. And you can see that in all of the writings of all of the, 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 the writers of the, of the uh, New Testament, the Old as well. Uh, but James just here just seems kind of specific. So uh, if you've been tracking with us, James has been wandering through a letter talking to the church that's just scattered because of the persecution that took place uh, in uh, Jerusalem, which is where he's pastoring. And so he has somewhat of an impoverished church. All those who could flee fled, um, and those who couldn't stayed. And so uh, he's pastoring a, a quite impoverished church. In fact, when Paul was going around in his missionary journeys, uh, he was taking up collection to give to the, the church in Jerusalem. And so uh, there's that little context. So uh, he's writing to them everywhere, and he's on a tirade right now he had just dealt with wisdom. There's two kinds of wisdom. He's frustrated because uh, the people who, who in his church who have come to Christ or at least uh, made a statement like that uh, have tended to be assaulted by some uh, uh, non-truths, people worldly for a different motive, evil motive, trying to come in and steal people from the church. And, and obviously that's a satanic thing. And so uh, he begins to say, hey, look, come on, there's two kinds of wisdom. This is so when you hear these people and they're wooing you away, don't go. That's, it's earthly. It's demonic. It creates chaos. It's, it's, it's all about selfish ambition. You remember that? We looked at that a couple of days ago. He said, but heavenly wisdom brings this purity and this peace. And, uh, you know, there's this, there's this power that comes with, with true wisdom. <clears throat> then he begins to, to talk about how that wisdom is creating quarrels in the church that's what we looked at yesterday <clears throat> conflict now and so he gets worked up in that passage as he talks about why there's conflict he's basically saying it's because you've accepted that worldly wisdom uh because you you want life to be about you and i don't want to rehash that you can listen to that one uh but then we ended yesterday with this one phrase and we're going to pick it up in chapter four verse four he says you adulterous people you can hear him saying that almost in this uh, in this angry tone where he's he's just frustrated like you would be at your kids because they're not listening they're not doing what what uh, what you you think is best for them and say come on kids you know pay attention this is kind of where he's saying here and so uh, it's a this section is filled with some brilliant truth of how to how to walk in the grace of God uh, how to repair it's not a good word to repair our relationship with God but you and I know that we're prone to wander and as we do that God's love remains constant his grace continues to lavish but there is a separation in our relationship 
um, that that as we begin to make our way back, we realize we've wandered off. He's always gracious. He is the we are the prodigal, and he is the father, and so he's always welcoming. But but there is this um, that God is opposed to those who choose to not submit to him. So you you run headlong when you don't want to do what God says. You're bumping up against uh, against a wall. And, and so this is where we are in the context. So uh, how do we repair a relationship? When we have um, drifted into the world and started chasing the world, James says, you're no different than an adulterer. That's no different than you, you, as a husband, your wife runs off and, and chases after a, a man um, and, and she realizes it and, and, and wants to make her way back. Or if a, a man has done that to a woman. So <clears throat> he's saying there's this relationship and it's been damaged because a, a, another entity has gotten in between and driven a wedge between what is to be a solid relationship. So when we chase the world, James says it's no different than committing adultery. In fact, all through the Old Testament, God uses that term uh, of, of adultery when uh, Jerusalem, I mean, when the Israelites would chase after false gods. And in fact, it was so frustrating at one point that he told Hosea, one of the prophets, I want you to marry a prostitute. I want you to know what it feels like to continue to chase after someone who's going to continue to hoard themselves and chase after something, not you. And, and so God's passionate about this as well. God means for us to be wholly in love with him, to let him be Lord of all, not, not a sort of kind of casual. The American Christianity is all about kind of a casual relationship. You can have the world in him too. That's all wrong. None of that's true. But that's what the, that's what the, the grander church in America is selling. Um, you know, your best life now and all of that, that foolishness. Uh, my best life is when I submit to the loving God, uh, not when, when I, I'm, I, find prosperity and all of the things that that, that brand of, of uh, church sells you. So uh, I can't flirt with the world and be faithful to God, right? I mean, there's that point, you know, right? Uh, we're so, well, I didn't, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't have an affair. I'm just, we're just a little flirting. Well, from a perspective of a spouse, a little flirting is not a small thing. And so this is what he's saying here. Anytime you and I flirt with the world, we start letting the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life begin to lure us away and we, we toy with it. We create a jealousy between God. This is what he says. You adulterous people, don't you know that <clears throat> friendship with the world is enmity, puts strife between you and God. It creates this chasm. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes themselves an enemy of God. Wow. I mean, that's that's powerful stuff, right? Um, and so he's letting us know, listen, when you choose that, you've decided you want God for an enemy. Uh, so he, this isn't a small thing he's talking about. Now, we're going to look at how to get through this uh, in a second, but he says this, <clears throat> Or do verse five, or do you suppose it is of to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Listen, when he made you alive and he deposited the Holy Spirit in you, like a wedding ring, that's what Ephesians says. It's a seal, it's a down payment of a of inheritance to come. So just like this ring that I wear on my hand is a seal that I'm married to, to Tammy. Uh, he's, he says, when, when you made that choice, that commitment, you put that ring on, uh, there's, he, I'm, I'm jealous. I don't want Tammy, when, when we gave each other rings, we don't want each other chasing after anything else. And God says, you, you, I gave you the spirit. I gave you that seal. You don't think I'm jealous about our relationship now? And this is what he says there. He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. He wants all of us. This is, this is what James is trying to tell us. Then he says this, but he, but he gives more grace. Listen, you, you and I can wander and he's, I, I mean, who can conceive the love of God? It's a, it's a reminder that even when we wander, just like the prodigal, the father is always waiting for the, for the prodigal to come back, lavishing with love, celebrating, creating a feast, 
there is grace upon grace is, is, is what takes place. And in fact, Paul, when he was talking about this grace, he says, I know you're thinking, well, then shouldn't we sin so that grace will abound more? Shouldn't we go run after the world so that grace will abound more? And he's like, no way. You know, may it never be. <clears throat> but he's, he's always opposed to the proud and to those who chase after the world. Uh, but he gives grace when we come back to him. And this is what he says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So uh, there is an opposition. When we choose the world, even to dabble in it, we create opposition between us and God. And nobody wants that. I want to live in the peace and favor and honor of God. Therefore, I have to decide I'm all in with him. This is what he's calling us to. This is what he's calling us for. <clears throat> and he says this, submit yourself. Now he's telling us, how do we get back? So we've had this affair. We've, we've chased after the world. How do we get back to where we want to be with God? And he gives us very clear steps. And so this is what we're going to spend our time, the rest of it on today. He says, submit yourselves to God. First and, first and foremost, the thing is, we, we, we have to understand that his ways are right, that that, that the world is a terrible lover. The world is a, is a, is a terrible uh, mistress that, that he, uh, so you come back and you submit, what, what, Lord, whatever you want, I'll, I want you. There's this submission. So we, we reconnect. We, uh, I think the book of the Revelation, when it talked about um, the Ephesus church, you all have done all these great things, but you've left your first love. He says, therefore, do the things you did at first. So what were those things? When you first fell in love with the Lord, part of submission means that we redo those things we did at first. Man, we were praying a lot more, weren't we? We were reading a lot more. We were, we were talking to him. We were talking to others about him. There was, this, there was this passion. He says, I want you to get back to that. That's what it means to submit to God, to realize that everything that you want in life is not found in the mistress of the world, but it's found in God. This, so, the, so the first step, the cure to, to, to coming back after having what James calls an affair with the world uh, <clears throat> is to submit to God, to go, God, you're right, and I'm so sorry. And, I, and the second thing is that, hey, that lover's not going to leave you alone, right? I mean, uh, they're still going to be chasing after you. So what are you going to do about that? Well, he says, you resist to the devil. Submit yourselves to the God. Resist to the devil, and he will flee from you. You tell the world, no. This is it. Just know whatever you have to do. Tammy and I had a, a friend of ours that had um, had an affair, and as, as they came back and were uh, getting right with their with their mate, part of what they did was have an accountability. So they didn't go anywhere alone because they just didn't want that temptation. They didn't want to, to, to run into the person with whom they had the affair and all of these things. And so there was this accountability that was built in. And this is what he's saying here. Hey, resist the devil. What does that mean? Well, it means it means you need to watch what you're watching. If, if, if something you're binging on in Netflix is leading you toward worldly ways, or you've got friends that are pulling you that way, then you need to you need to you need to guard those relationships. Find some new ones. This is what he's talking about. Be as drastic as, as necessary. Resist the devil. Don't you you can't afford to flirt and go, well, we're just going to be friends now. No, you can't. You can't do that. Um, you, you have to watch what you see, what what you hear, watch what you do. Um, those are that's a part of it. Just rein your thoughts and everything in um, in the extremities, right? I mean, let's just get back to that old fashioned uh, prudishness, if you will. That's what has to happen when you've when you've found yourself headlong in the world. You gotta you gotta run from it. You gotta resist the devils. I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. Get an accountability partner, just like our friend did. Whatever you have to do, but that's what you do. Resist the devil. And, and God says at some point he's going to flee, he'll flee from you. When you do that, when you say no, uh, he, he, he will not, he doesn't always like move on, but, but, but he'll flee. He, he understands he has no power over you. And so, so this is, this is what he says. And then, so first thing is submit, which means we align ourselves with him. We do the things we did at first. We resist the devil. We stay away from, from that, which we've been having that affair with. And the third thing is we draw near, uh, as we draw near to God. He draws near to us. The, the, more, the more we press into God, the bigger his arms get, the more he pulls us in. So, so our job at this point then is to draw near. It's kind of doing the things we did at first. So what does that mean to, to draw near to God? It means to, 
to let the Word meditate on it. Let it begin to saturate our life. Let the Word of God be at home in my life. See, a lot of times when people are chasing after the world, they're, 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 not, they're not spending time letting the Word do its thing. Get, get some good uh, study time in. Get some good prayer time in. Find that prayer closet. Get some friends around you. Uh, that, that you can worship together with and you can worship God. There's that drawing in that happens. That's why we cannot not afford to gather together as believers in Christ. I don't care what the world says. And I'm not talking about persecution. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm not even talking political. I'm saying gather with the body of Christ. If you got to wear a 15 mask or whatever it is you do, but you gather because it's important because it's a part of what it means to draw near to God. And, and God speaks to us through through community, through others in the body of Christ. That's why we have gifts, and that's why we have fruit of the Spirit, so that we can be an encouragement and nourishment to each other. And so these are the things. He says, draw near to God, and those are the ways in which we do it. And then he says this, um, draw near to God, and he's going to draw near to you. That's a great promise. Man, we, God's not like, no, uh, uh-uh, prove to me, right? Like, like if if one of us had an affair on one of our mates, right? Think of me. I don't, I don't trust you. No, no, I'm not. No, God, God's not that way. God is not standing there going, prove me, prove to me. He's just simply saying, hey, if you draw near to me, I'm, I'm drawing near to you. We're gonna get. We're gonna. We're gonna have this relationship. How good is God that He's like that? Then He says. Uh, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He's like, uh, you you just can't allow yourself to go there. Um, and and so he's saying, what what does he mean by that? Well, there's confession, right? Uh, I need to I need to confess to cleanse my hands. If there's a confession. God, here's what I've done wrong. He needs to hear that. You need to say it. He needs to hear it. Uh, you confess to God. Then he says, um, purify your hearts. That's repentance. That's where we we go through a, a time of grieving over our sin. Listen, it's too easy to go, oh, I'm sorry, God. Sorry, God. Sorry, God. Sorry, God. Where that's a confession, but not a mourning. This is what he says, right? Be, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. He said, listen, take seriously the fact that you've wandered away into the world and that that's not been what you want. And so what's he saying to do? Spend some time. Grieve over your sin. See it as God sees it, right? Look at it and go, man, I can't believe I, I can't believe I was watching those things. I can't believe I was doing that activity. I can't believe I stayed and listened to this foolishness and this talk and this, this stuff. I, I can't believe I'm doing that. That's what it means to in verse 8 and 9. That's what he's calling us to do, and that has to happen. It has to happen in a relationship marriage-wise when there's been an affair. There has to be that mourning and grieving and putting yourself in the other person's place and seeing it from their vantage point and, and empathizing. And this is what God's asking us to do. And then he leaves us with this promise, and I got to get. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Everything he said is about humbling ourselves. And what does he say? He will exalt you. Listen, God's not in, in, into beating you down and keeping you down. God wants to lift you up. And he says, you, by, by you realizing the world has been uh, your lover and you're done with it, and you do the steps that we just talked about that James outlines, he says that is what it means to humble yourselves. And when you do that, God's going to lift you up. He's going to put your feet back on that solid ground. And and he's going to wipe that sin away. And he's your forever lover. This is good stuff. I'm I'm loving the book of James. And so, uh, hey, listen, let's take stock today. You know, where where have we allowed the world? We'll be flirting with the world. Let's stop it. Can I just encourage you to let's stop it? Let's you and me make a commitment. We're going to stop that stuff today. All right. Love you guys. I'll see you tomorrow.